We are joined via telephone by the Senate Education Chair, Senator Amy Grady. Senator Grady, good morning. Thank you so much for being with us today. Good morning. Thanks for having me. You are a school teacher, but uh, school's out this week where you teach, correct? It is, yes. We're on spring break. We started yesterday, and we go back next Monday. So I'm trying to enjoy the week. I have not had a break since legislative session. I went straight into the classroom, so um, I'm a little tired. <laughs> well, I always appreciate you doing the show, uh, and uh, during the school year, I always try to make sure that it's not while you're in class because I hate to take your attention away from the little ones. What, what grade do you teach, Amy? I teach fourth grade. Fourth grade. What do you do while you're a senator for 60 days? What happens to your classroom? So I get to hand select my sub, um, and so they, I had the same person in the classroom for the entire nine weeks. And so nine weeks is a long time to be away from your class, so I have a lot of teacher guilt there. Uh -huh. But um, I'm thankful that the county lets me hand select who goes in because they're essentially going to be taken over, and it's going to be their classroom for nine weeks. So it's it's uh, really important to me. But um, I'm always happy to be back. It's uh, I love both jobs, but being with my nine and ten year olds, there's nothing like it. Well, that's awesome, and we salute the work that you do teaching the kids uh, and uh, getting them ready for that next grade level and to become uh, fine young humans, which uh, well, thank you. unfortunately, as we've been discussing on the program today, and you may have heard in our open an incident in Berkeley County uh, last week where a young person called in a bomb threat, uh, we've been discussing discipline in the classrooms, and I know you had a bill that you were set to get passed and instituted for this year. Can you tell us what happened to that bill? You know, Rob, I wish I knew. <laughs> um, I'll be honest with you. The, the agreement was that bill would pass. Um, when I passed, We, you know, the House chairman and I had an agreement uh, that we would pass, you know, certain bills that we'd pass over and which ones would, would complete legislation. And that one was an agreement, and everybody wanted it. It was really important. I think it was the most important bill education-wise when it came to um, in, in the entire legislative session. Uh, but the chairman didn't run it on that Saturday night. I can give you my speculations as to why he didn't, but I don't want to do that because I don't have the facts. Okay. Uh, but all I know is that he didn't hold up his end of the agreement, and uh, I'm not really happy about it. As a matter of fact, I'm really disappointed because, you know, we listen and we tell teachers all the time we're listening to you. And this was the number one thing that they brought to us and said we need to have some authority over discipline in our classroom, and this bill would have done that. And uh, we couldn't finish. We couldn't, you know, push it through. And that's it's really disappointing because I know a lot of educators who are disappointed in it and feel as if we possibly were just paying lip service to them. Senator, this is Delegate John Hardy. I, I believe that bill did pass House Education, but it did not make it to the floor, correct? Right. Well, it, John, it passed House Education. It came back over to the Senate. There were some technical changes that needed to be made, and our attorneys met up um, to change those. The chairman was aware of that. And was sent back over, but was not what just just left alone then. And so um, there was another bill that was that was also tied in with that. That was also part of the agreement that didn't pass either. So you know, I haven't talked to the chairman. I sent him a couple of text messages. He has not responded to me. So you know, I always tell people a lot of times that teaching fourth graders is much like being or being in the legislature is much like teaching your fourth graders because uh, they're just a little taller and they wear ties. <laughs> so we'll, see, we'll, we'll see what we can get past with this, but I'm, I'm not certain how it's going to go. We had students on uh, a couple of young ladies from Spring Mills High School who were opposed to this bill, Senator Grady, and there was a lot of information, some say misinformation, flying around about what this bill would do and wouldn't do. Can you give us the, the, the facts of the bill as you would have liked to have seen it passed? I can. So, I, so I'm wondering if their concerns, so I didn't hear that, you know, but I'm wondering if their concerns had to do with um, students with IEPs or students with disabilities. That's a lot of what we heard whenever people were coming to us and saying we have some concerns about this because if a student has a disability and they have an IEP, are we just kicking kids out of class? Number one, if they have an IEP, there are already steps that are provided that say, that say how you should handle that child's behavior. That's the purpose for their IEP. The second thing, um, we add, I added in that bill the authorization for the counties to use child find, if a child is removed from the classroom, to use child find, which is a way for them to assess and see if their behavior is caused by a disability, which we should be using anyway. And so it's a way to identify kids who possibly may have a disability that we don't see in the classroom, that we could get them the help that they need. Um, and so I think that's mostly what the concern was over, uh, suspending or getting kids out of the classroom that possibly have a disability. But I'll tell you what, Rob, the problem is 
a lot of times, you know, if a teacher, you tell me what other profession that a person has to go to work and, and has to and is expected to put up with somebody hitting them, kicking them, cussing at them, throwing things at them. There is no other profession where somebody is expected just to put up with that and be okay with it. But teachers have to every day. And so, you know, they may have their child, the child removed from their classroom for a little while, and they're sent back in by administrators saying, you know, okay, so provide this for them or put them in a certain spot in the room. Um, if a teacher feels unsafe in their classroom or, more importantly, the other students feel unsafe, we have focused so many of our resources and our efforts on, on correcting behavior and trying to help the one child that's causing the problems when we're ignoring the other 19 in the classroom who are there to learn and some of them who come there for as their safe space. It may be the only safe space they, that they have. They may come from a home where they don't feel safe and school is their safe place, but we're allowing one child to take that away. So it's not just kicking kids out of school. It's actually removing them, trying to get them the help that they need. The bill allowed for counties to uh, utilize services across county lines. So if a county didn't have a behavior intervention plan or behavior intervention specialist in their county, they could utilize the person in, in the county next to them until they had a system or some sort of intervention set up. Um, so, you know, I think 21 of our elementary schools do have some sort of uh, intervention plan or intervention program, and so many more are looking into doing it, and that's what we're trying to encourage. But in the meantime, we want to allow teachers to use their discretion when they feel unsafe, you know, and to say, I feel unsafe and my students feel unsafe, this child needs to be out of the classroom, and that's the most important thing. Matt Miller. So basically, again, take us into more of the, the nuts and bolts of, of this bill. It would have allowed for certain suspensions and or, or students to be removed from classrooms that currently cannot be? Yes, Matt. So it would, it would um, allow for students, and the, the words in the bill that were used were vi threatening, violent, and harassing behaviors. So for a teacher to use their discretion, and keep in mind that teachers make hundreds, if, up, if thousands sometimes it feels like, um, of decisions a day where we are told to use our discretion on things. You know, whenever things happen between our students or there are different, different things, use our discretion. A, a teacher's discretion is a very good tool. Um, so this would allow the teacher to use their discretion to remove, have a child removed from their classroom, and the principal of the building would not be allowed to send them back that day. So what would happen is they, the principal would have to set up some sort of plan for that child for the remainder of the day. They could not ride the bus home in the afternoon because if it's a violent behavior, the worst place to put a child on is on the bus because there's usually, you know, most buses don't have an aide and you just have the bus driver and unsupervised kids. And so um, it would require them to, have to call the parent to have them come get, get them picked up or some sort of transportation at the end of the day or them to take them up right then and then the child would be out of the classroom for two to th one to three days depending on how long it takes the county to set up an alternative learning plan and then they would be put on whatever alternative learning plan that that county has available most like i said some counties have behavior intervention programs where they could set up and take that child and have that child participate in that program but the counties that don't would have to do either homebound they would have to do virtual learning. Um, those would be the two options that they would have. And is that ideal? Not necessarily. And that was part of the argument is that it's not ideal for that learner. But what's ideal for the other 19? You know, we have to look at it and say, what are we in the business of doing in schools? We're in the business of teaching kids. And if you have one, one child who's causing the others not to be able to learn, we need to focus on the other 19 and try to get that child as much help as we possibly can. But the focus needs to be on the class, the students in the classroom who are trying to learn. Have you had to deal with a situation like this personally, or uh, uh, certainly, I'm, I'm sure, have worked with others even within your school that have dealt with this? You know, I'm I am really lucky. I teach at a very small rural school. We're a lot like. Um, little family each class has one there's one class per grade level so the kids come to school and they're pretty much um, grow up together they're like a little family there and we don't have a lot of behavior issues I think for that reason um, you know we may have a couple of students maybe that I would say this bill could probably pertain to in our whole school but I have talked to teachers from other counties teachers from other schools who have said they are ready to quit. I'm talking about teachers who have 25 years of experience, who are ready to say, I'm looking for something else to do because I just can't do this anymore. And a lot of the problem, Matt, is that um, they say they have administrators who try to be really supportive, 
But a lot of times the administrators want to be supportive but also feel like you can love the kids so much that you can change their behaviors. And, you know, sometimes that works, but sometimes it doesn't. You know, sometimes the child needs a lot more help than just a lot of love to change the behavior. And I'm a big proponent of saying we've got to get parents involved and have them take responsibility for some of the behaviors of the children because a lot of times we're trying to make excuses for these children. I know a lot of them have gone through trauma, but when they become adults, we don't get to make excuses for them then. They have laws that they have to follow, and it doesn't matter what kind of trauma you've gone through. So we've got to train them and teach them how to deal with their trauma and how to use and, and use their behaviors and, and interact with people the way they're supposed to. The earlier we do that, the better off we're going to see them as they get older. John Bodwell. Amy, it sounds to me like this is a no-brainer, and, and I know a lot of teachers, and one of the things that I've heard from teachers is they'll refer somebody up. They'll, they'll, talk to, they'll try to talk to an admin, and the admins sort of push it back to them because the admins don't want to deal with it. The admins don't want to deal with the families and stuff like that, and it seems like legislation like this would, would force them to have to support their teachers a little bit more. Right, and that was part of the reason also. It was the reason that it was left at teacher discretion. You know, I, I, I had this um, bill in mind last fall, John, and uh, I worked on it until probably the, I think it was the second week of February before I actually had it finalized because I wanted it to be perfect. And then I realized it's not going to be perfect. You know, there's no way to make it perfect when you're dealing with human beings and you're dealing with children. So, you know, you, we, we made it. I made it the best that I possibly could. I worked with disability advocates to make sure that we got it, it you know, right so that it wouldn't um, unnecessarily cause kids with disabilities to be removed from the classroom and not, you know, not given the help that they need. Um, and so teachers – Teachers were really, really excited and happy about this bill because, for the same reason you said, some of them felt like their administrators just weren't supportive. Now, some do, and I'll, and I'll tell you, I think most administrators are. Um, there's the, the push for not suspending kids that we've had in, a lot, in the last few years because we want to keep our attendance rates up. And when kids need to be in school, I understand that. I think that's caused a lot of it, is they, they don't want to suspend kids because um, they, they want to keep the numbers up. And sometimes you just have to look at it and say, you know, what's best for the majority? And, and that's what we have to do. So, you know, I'm worried about um, how many teachers we're going to see just give in and give up because, you know, we have kindergartners, th kindergartners throwing chairs through the window. We have um, second graders cussing teachers out and threatening to kill them. You know, there, there are so many things that teachers deal with that people don't realize. Our um, – I was speaking with a gentleman in Jackson County the other day. That's part of my district, and he has been a long-term sub for two years. Prior to that, he wasn't a teacher, and he came up to me the other day, and he said, I have a brand-new appreciation for what teachers go through. I didn't realize that children's behavior was the way it is, and I think, you know, I see this funny meme going around on Facebook that says everybody should serve um, as a substitute teacher just like you do jury duty, and, uh, <laughs> you know, we lit, laugh and giggle about that, but I, I, but I kind of think that would you know, be a real eye-opener for people if you had to serve even one or two days as a teach, substitute teacher just to see – how these kids behave, they're not the same as what we were. You know, we're not talking about the kids who can't sit still. We're talking about violent behaviors that are just, that are really, really dangerous or threatening to other kids in the classroom, you know. And how fair is it for those other kids to come to school and be on pins and needles and not be able to relax and learn in a safe environment? It's not fair. Before, Amy, I think, you, I think you hit the nail on the head. Hold on one second. Let's John. look at the, the – the overall group as opposed to let's look at the, the the what is good for the overall group not what is good for one kid yeah you right. know and you know I, i'm not saying that we should ignore the needs of that one child i'm not saying that at all and you know i'm very compassionate i i really want to help every kid kids are they all matter and they all can be something but when we're using all of our resources and all of our time and focusing all of the extra time that we have on the one child's behavior. I know teachers right now, Rob, that um, spend two hours at the end of the school day, throughout the day and at the end of the school day, doing behavior logs for students because they've been told by their administrators that they need to keep a behavior log in case something happens so they'll have evidence or data to say, well, this is how long this has been going on. You know, when they could be using those extra hours to plan for more meaningful instruction, you know, or, or towards anything else. That's what's burning teachers out is are these types of things. And so uh, it's just ridiculous. I think it was, like you said, a no-brainer. It's a bill that should have passed. It's one that we started talking about in the fall. 
was really needed, and it didn't complete legislation. John Hardy, before you go, I just want to read this comment. Jackie Long posted in our Facebook comment section with our live stream. She's the president, uh, vice president, I should say, of the Board of Education in Berkeley County. Now, this, Again, this is coming from the vice president of the Board of Education in Berkeley County. I'm going to read it as it's written. I had someone tell me yesterday that in a meeting with a teacher, a parent, and a student, the student told the teacher to shut the F up, and that parent then said to the teacher, you heard her, shut the F up. This, and this is what we're dealing with. We got some winning oh, yeah. winners. Well, Sen Senator, that leads into to my question. So, you know, we're constitutionally bound, um, you know, as the West Virginia legislature and, and, and our state government to provide a, a free and thorough education. Do, do you mm -hmm. think that there is some direction or some thought process to somewheres down the road where we are going to say, listen, we're, you know, three strikes, four strikes, five strikes, wherever we end up being in the process where we've tried to involve the children, the parents, we have tried to intervene in every which way that we possibly can. We understand that we have a troubled student that we can, that can just not perform in public schools where we'll just say, listen, here's your share of the education funds that you receive for like a hope scholarship and say, you know, here, here's the, here's the money that you would receive if you were a homeschooler or if you went to a private school or if you did something differently and said, now that is your option. You have given, you know, four or five, six options to try to uh, curtail the behavior. We've tried to get the parents into a program, uh, you know, where with maybe some parenting skills and, you know, this is not a one strike and you're out. This is definitely someone who's habitual and, and is really just the school system cannot control to a point where we just say, listen, we are going to provide you with the funds, your portion of the funds, and, and you'll have to figure out your education process from here. You know, John, I, I mean, I think that's really interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm a proponent of, and a lot of people are surprised to hear this because I'm a public school teacher, but of a school choice. I believe a parent sh should have the right to choose the be best educational opportunities for their child. You know, but what I'm afraid of happening with the Hope Scholarship and a lot of um, different opportunities is that public schools are going to end up being the dumping ground for kids who can't behave. Because what's going to happen if we don't do something like this is parents, the parents who are tired of these behaviors, are going to pull their children out and give them a different opportunity because not because they're not receiving the education from the teacher standpoint or from the school standpoint, but because of the behaviors that you're seeing in the classroom. I have a friend who, who is doing that next year, putting um, her children in a Christian school because she said, I just, these behaviors in these classrooms are not right. They're not fair for my kids. And so if we don't do the opposite, like something that you mentioned, um, give the opportunity for that parent or that family to send the troubled child somewhere else so that we can save the rest of the school or the rest of the public schools, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, you know, we, we give so many opportunities, and we have to finally take a stand and say, this is enough. Enough is, is enough. You know, we cannot provide the rest of these children with an education that they need because of your child's behavior. And if you can't help us fix it, then they're going to have to go somewhere else. And, you know, a lot of people think that sounds, um, I guess, mean-spirited or – but it's not you know i'm looking out trying to look out for and we should be looking out for the majority of those kids and given the other opportunity to that other child to say you know here are other opportunities but then again if they go to a charter school or they go to a private school they don't have the means to deal with a child's behavior like this either you know they they're not equipped or not prepared for something like that so you know it's kind of catch-22 what do we do but it's a huge problem and we've got to figure out a solution well, the advantage the private school has is they can kick the troublesome child and parent out of the schools. They don't have to take them the next yeah. year, and you do. Absolutely. You're right. You're absolutely right. And so um, I'm not against that at all. You know, like I said, I would love to find a way that, you know, we keep talking about losing teachers. And when, and, and when we talk about losing teachers, we're always hearing the pay, the pay, the pay, the pay. You know, I'm a teacher, and I'm surrounded by teachers. You know, one thing I don't hear about is the pay. Hmm. It's the last thing that comes out of anybody's mind. It's not that we, you know, don't think that we need a higher pay, especially in your all's area because, you know, you're going right across the, across the state border to mm -hmm. Maryland and they can make so much more. But they mention things like this, discipline, having, helping us deal with the children that we cannot 
do anything with. And, and that's the biggest problem. You know, that is the biggest problem. And so if, until we help them deal with the biggest problem, we're going to lose teachers. We're going to lose our quote unquote good students that are going to be pulled out to do, uh, go to public charter schools or they're going to go to Christian schools or they're going to go and do homeschooling just because they don't want their child exposed to the types of behaviors that we're seeing now. You know, looking at those comments that Jackie Long posted, John's idea is if, if you're in a meeting and you have a parent who says, you heard my child, shut the F up, I would go into my desk, I'd pull out a check for $4,921.18 or whatever. I would say, here you go, you deal with your kid and, and see you. Don't yeah, let the know, door hit you. I, I couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine that happening back when I was in school. You know, I graduated in 98. And so I can't, I can't imagine just how much has changed from then to now. Um, in, and, and I'm sure there were parents like that back then. You know, we didn't see it. I'm, I definitely my parents weren't like that. But um, I could, I'm sure there were. We just were oblivious to it. But I guarantee it wasn't like it is now, as many. And, you know, and a lot of times, um, I know you have kids that are growing up without parents. They're growing up in foster homes or they're growing up with grandparents, you know. And, and I know that that creates some uh, helps create some of these behaviors or doesn't help help uh, change them. But we keep making excuses for the behaviors. We, we are constantly making excuses for the behaviors instead of trying to help them to um, adjust and adapt and say, you know, okay, this is what happened to you. This is, this is terrible, but we've got to teach you how to get along in life regardless of that. We are coddling them and saying, "Well, this happened to you, so we're going to make things. We're going to make things a little easier. We're going to make things different, or we're going to expect different things from you." And when we shouldn't do that, you know, we're leading them, we're sending them up through high school and out into adulthood, already preparing them for failure by doing that. We have to prepare them and, and at an early age and say, "This is the ex these are the expectations," and I'm sorry that you've gone through what you've gone through, but we have this is what you you have to do. And I think you'd be really surprised at how resilient kids are. They definitely are. Mm -hmm. Senator Grady, do you have a final comment, John? Yeah, I just think it's really important for people to understand that, you know, not to live in the rearview mirror. I mean, you, you can learn mm -hmm. from your past. You can you can try to be a better person. You have come through difficult situations, but always be looking forward. Um, never let your past define you and always be trying to better yourself. And I think if that was what we tried to teach and preach to these children that are coming from these difficult situations is nothing defines you. Your future, your, your full, full future is ahead of you and, and, and try to, you know, continue to move forward. I think we would put these children in a much better position. Good words, man. Amen, John. Senator Grady, thank Amen. you so much. Enjoy your vacation. You're welcome. Listen, I'm sorry if I got on my soapbox there, but I'm really passionate about this issue, and um, and I really want people to listen and to learn why it's important. So I appreciate you guys bringing this to the forefront and, and having a conversation about it this morning. Never apologize for your passion, Senator. We enjoyed it. Thank you, Rob. You all have a good day. You thank too. You.